Okay, excellent. Um, so I'll start off with the actual term itself. So fake news was the Collins English Dictionary Word of the Year in 2017. And despite the fact, of course, that fake news is two words, I can promise you that is actually true. But fake news is a smaller part of this phenomenon of um, public opinion manipulation that we see in today's world. But all of it is far from new. In fact, at every stage in the past where we've seen a new communications technology come along, we've seen that there's a battle for the hearts and the minds of the people who use it. So we've seen it with printing press and radio and TV and so on. And not all of that is necessarily fake news. Quite often it's just promoting one opinion over another one, but it's always about controlling the views of a population. So we'll take some examples. So here's a story that I guarantee most of you have read. It's actually from 1517, um, when a priest called Martin Luther nailed a copy of a document called the 95 Theses to a church in Wittenberg in Germany. And essentially at the time, he, was, um, he had a couple of differences of views with the Catholic Church. But the important thing is not so much the document, but what happened next. So four printing presses around Germany created copies of his work about two months later. And within two weeks, it had spread to all of Germany, within about four weeks to all of Christendom, and ultimately um, brought about the Protestant Revolution. Now, this isn't an example of fake news, but it is actually public opinion manipulation, although, albeit in a non-negative way. So Luther and his followers wanted to change the opinions of large parts of the population, and succeeded in doing it by leveraging the communications at the time. And importantly, they could communicate their message out faster than ever before because of the printing press, and also faster than those controlling the current communications technology could actually control. So fast forward 400 years to 1917, a time when newspaper was kind of king. And in World War I, uh, the English used a series of propaganda campaigns, which nowadays we would consider fake news. Um, this particular one claimed that because Germany were low on fats, they were actually rendering down their battlefield corpses to make fats out of, which is needless to say didn't actually happen. But the German military after the war actually claimed that some of the, the so-called fake news campaigns um, leveraged by the British were so good at de degrading the morale of their troops that they put it down as one of the reasons for their ultimate loss. A view which Hitler himself shared, which is one of the reasons he went so heavy on propaganda use in World War II. And we've seen the same in other media like radio and so on over time. But eventually what happens is laws do catch up. So in the 1600s, there was the printing laws in Europe were brought into place. 1930s, you see the FCC and so on. But in the case of the internet, that hasn't really happened yet. So when most of our users of the internet today think of the internet, they think of a nice, safe, modern shopping mall with all the various different brands up in the storefronts. When in reality, more cynical people like us um, see it more as the Wild West, right? So that it's, you know, doesn't the net slack of borders and ease of access of the information make it easier than ever to access the world's information, but it's also easier than ever to manipulate the world's information. So why are these platforms so vulnerable to manipulation? Well, the fact is many of them are all about actually taking the opinions of others and using it as your own. So trusting the opinion or this is the wisdom of the crowd. So whether it's likes or stars or plus ones or whatever, we use others' opinion and form our own based on that. And um, even sites that are heavily review-based, things like you know, TripAdvisor or uh, those type of ones, the actual star rating can have a bigger impact on what your opinion is going to be than reading through the hundreds of quite valuable uh, reviews. And this isn't a new idea. Um, it's been around in psychology for a long time. We hear it's called the uh, bandwagon effect. So as more and more people basically trust in an idea, more people will take up that opinion as their own until you get to a certain point where regardless of the evidence, people will actually join the bandwagon as such. And all of these examples are all proven fake news or use of fake reviews. So all networks struggle with manipulation, financial or political. Uh, Facebook probably found themselves most in the media recently because it's been caught up with the war of words going on between the US and Russia, and that led to Mark Zuckerberg doing a number of comments on this. But if you think about a platform like this, their mission is to allow the world to communicate together in a free way, right? Um, and I honestly do believe a network like Facebook don't want to be manipulated by any government, domestic or foreign. But the business model that they use to kind of um, finance all of that is to allow advertisers to target their users with advertisements that maybe have interested them, genuinely have interested them. But if you look at the, the, what we saw here in the election with fake news spread um, with a pro-Russian slant, um, a lot of that was essentially a non-paying, non-vetted advertiser using the platform. But otherwise, the platform behaved exactly as it's supposed to for promoting around stories and things that people found interesting. 
So this led to us doing a paper last year uh, on fake news and public opinion manipulation written by Lion, Vlad, and Fyodor, who you can all see looking dapper on the slide. And I'm going to cover parts of this, but the whole thing's about 80 pages, but it's uh, freely available online. So I can't cover all of it, but I'll get to the main points. So what we figured was for a successful campaign to work, there's three critical elements, which we call the fake news triangle. And just like the fire triangle, if you remove any one of these, it's much, much less effective. So firstly, you have motivation. That's the opinions of a target group you want to change. Then you have social networks. You need them to actually get the message to the people. And then there's various tools and services to help amplify your message. So an experience manipulation campaign won't just put out a simple story. What they will do is they will put out a story and then another layer of stories underneath. Most people will believe the first story, but the second ones are there for the more savvy person who thinks, actually, I don't fully believe this. They do their extra research, they find a second layer of stories. Now they believe they've uncovered the real truth, which is in fact just another lie put there for them. And once you've got those stories crafted, the next thing is there's a whole bunch of services that let you promote that. So regardless of the network um, in use, if you want to promote an account or various posts, you can buy tons of different services to get followers and views and likes and so on. In fact, you can even tweet, I want to buy followers, and automated bot accounts will reply back to you with advertisements, which is very cool. Um, so and this is the far most um, advertised form of manipulation you can find online, or things that can help manipulation. Um, and as mentioned, the more followers and views something has, the kind of more validity it has in terms of those reading the actual article. So setting up the accounts to do this sort of stuff, to do all that liking and following and so on, is generally a manual process, because you have to get rid of things like CAPTCHAs or SMS verification and so on. Um, but the actual adminning of it, there's a ton of different bot setups for this, ranging from software to what you can see in the slide, which is a hardware solution. So this one was advertised for about 14,000 in China. And for that, you get all the hardware and software you need to control 100 mobile devices. Um, those 100 mobile devices, this can be great if you want to do manipulation on a mobile platform, but also just for avoiding bot detection that might give better rating to a mobile client versus a desktop one. And then bots are perfect for simple operation, likes, retweets, that sort of things. But the more socially intensive um, interactions, like reviews and comments, this is where humans really come into their own. So you have a service like Vtope, which is a Russian site. It has over 2 million users, which will write those type of comments and reviews for you. And they essentially do those tasks for points. Um, those points, if you are a manipulator, you can get those points from doing tasks yourself or simply by paying for them, which is the most common. So anyone wanting to run a manipulation campaign can greatly enhance their own one with positive comments or silence uh, another one. And that distinction between crowdsourcing of humans versus actual bots is something we see as different between the Russian kind of underground for this stuff and the Chinese one. That's not the only difference, but you have services like like for you which is this one on the slide. They offer both bots and humans, um, and they will give you advice on which to use in a given situation. Um, as you'd expect, humans are more expensive, but they're better at avoiding bot detection than a bot, obviously. Um, so that's not the only difference. Um, Chinese services we see cater more to Chinese social networks, like Weibo and Renren. Uh, Arabic services were a lot like uh, the English-speaking ones, but they have some restrictions on certain political views you can express or religious views. But all of these so far are very much a gray area, at least in our team's opinion, um, between legitimate promotion and actual manipulation. Because there's a lot of businesses and celebrities that will buy followers and likes and retweets and so on to amplify their own message as part of their standard PR and marketing campaigns. What's more insidious is something like online vote manipulation services. So JetS.ru is a bespoke service. You tell them what site you want to cast your votes on and manipulate. You tell them which way you want it split, you know, all positive or split it whichever way. And then you can configure it like you can see in the slide based on how hard the vote is going to be. Do they have to do like CAPTCHA solving? Do they have to do, you know, what, whatever the case may be. And it eventually gives you a dollar amount or actually a ruble amount per vote. So in this case, this would be 850 US dollars for about 100, or sorry, 10,000 votes on that given site. So services like this appear to think that democracy is far too important to be left down to voters to decide. Um, so I'm going to give you an example of a fake news campaign we put together ourselves, or fake, fake news campaign. Um, and this is based on a real case of a Mexican journalist called Carmen, um, I was going to say Santiago, that's wrong, Carmen Aristegui. Um, so she is a very outspoken journalist against the cartels in Mexico and corruption uh, within government. 
And she had a smear campaign launched against her whereby people alleged that government soldiers had raided her house and also that, the, um, that she was having an affair with a businessman in order to get a better job at one of the news networks in Mexico. And all of this was coordinated under a Twitter hashtag, Los Secretos de Aristigüey, which was later proven to be backed up by actual bot followers. So we're going to do something similar. We're going to again, again try to discredit a journalist, of course fake, um, but the first thing you need to do is come up with a story that is going to be damaging to that journalist, but also believable. And the believable part is important. There's a theory normally in political science called the Overton window. So essentially in the middle is the views that the world's population currently hold as true. And in either side, you've got differing views ranging from sensible to radical to extreme. So if you want to get somebody all the way to an extreme view, you can't just go straight there. You have to bring them through those layers so when you suggest the extreme view, they're far more likely to believe it than they would have been in the first place. But today, because we're drowning in news and people tend to only read headlines before making an opinion, it's easier and faster than ever before to shift this window. So there's even, uh, for example, there was this article that 70% of Facebook users only uh, read the headline of a science story before sharing it. This was shared 64,000 times, despite the fact that the article itself is entirely made up of filler text. Um, now, of course, some of those 64,000 did it for fun, right? But I guarantee all of them didn't. And there's actually real academic studies which put this figure around 59% for this exact same behavior. So let's put that together in our campaign. Let's assume we have a journalist who has about 50,000 followers, puts out three investigative uh, reports every week with about 200 comments on them on average. And our manipulator wants to take out a four week smear campaign. So they do a new fake news story every week. The first thing they'll want to do is to promote their own story. They do that by buying retweets and visits and so on, and also by getting a nice mix of comments on their story. So a mixture, not all purely positive, because that will not look legitimate, but a mix, but definitely slanted towards positive. The next thing to do then is to poison the journalist's own profile. So to get a whole bunch of bot followers for that journalist, they start sending negative comments tagging that person, and they also tag that person back to the fake stories that they've created. And then the final step would be to poison the journalist's own articles. So this would be actively dislike them, um, actively post negative comments on the real articles, and then actually promote the real articles now that they've got so much negative comments on them. And the end result in this case for about 55,000 is anybody searching for information on this journalist will find a very fragmented view or even negative view of that person, and any real opinions they're trying to express will be greatly drowned out as a result. Now, in the case of the real case of Carmen Ristergay, it was likely much cheaper to run than this um, because it didn't go to this extreme. We don't know exactly how much because whoever did that campaign didn't use our team for their fake news broker of choice, uh, which is not a service that Trend Micro provide, just out of interest. Um, so fake news and manipulation is a reality that we see today, but what can society do about it? Well, there's a bunch we can actually do and there's a bunch that is being done by social networks in particular. So a lot of what we talked about is bot-based, and bots can be ID'd. So here's an example of uh, around the Twitter hashtag Macron leaks, which was on the eve of the French election when there's uh, documents leaked on Macron. So in purple is English comments, and in green is French ones. And most of this graph represents genuine conversations between real humans. But zooming out a bit, we see some things like isolated communities. So these are people with a single person with a bunch of different followers that only follow them or a few select others and retweet everything they say, which is essentially a sign of bot behavior. And this could have been an attempt to push a so-called last minute swing effect, which we've seen in other elections. Now that's only one way to ID bots. There's tons of others based on post count, age of the account, even down to avatars, how often they post and so on. And there's some excellent papers in this, which most of which have been implemented by the major social networks today. They're actually quite good at blocking bots. But IDing a bot campaign and figuring out who is behind the bot campaign is an entirely more difficult subject to do. So bot detection is only one thing that a lot of these providers are doing. Uh, Google have started implementing in their news and search um, checks of, against uh, fact-checking organizations, 100 independent ones. Uh, Facebook have done a bunch. They've trialed a whole, bo a whole host of different fake uh, post detections to varying success. They've been very good at shutting down a lot of bots on their network as well. And they've even taken out print uh, media advice uh, for their users in the UK. 
Uh, Twitter uh, trialed a fake news button, which doesn't seem to work as well as would be expected, as it wasn't rolled out globally. They've also been very aggressive in shutting down bots. They took down 3,000 associated with the infamous kind of Russian group, the Internet Research Agency, which is one of the main ones pushing fake news uh, stories during the US elections. But arguably, they're more in the spotlight than any other group due to some of their, let's call them high profile users. So and we're starting to see uh, some laws and standards come in, just as we saw with the printing press and radio and everything else. So on the left, um, you have uh, one from the EU. On the right is one from my own country, from Ireland. And these are all kind of positive stories and would make you feel that things are going to be OK. But in reality, it's actually a lot different. So we're living in so-called post-truth era, which basically means emotions are more important than facts. And today you can actually come up with fact, or you can say completely non-factual things, and there's almost no penalty when you get caught. And I can't think of a better example than this video, which hopefully we play, of the US ambassador to the Netherlands. Do we have sound? We do not have sound. I will explain it. Um, it does kind of misses it if you don't have it. So essentially, he gets asked about a range of comments that he made in the past about um, politicians being set in fire in the Netherlands by Muslim immigrants and a whole bunch of things. He then promptly denies that he ever made any of those comments whatsoever. They then show him a video of him saying exactly verbatim what the journalist told him he said a minute ago, um, and which he had previously called fake news. Um, it then comes back to him in a second where they say, well, okay, so you're saying that what we just told you was fake news? And he says, no, I, I didn't use the word fake news today, despite the fact he'd said it 30 seconds earlier on the tape. End result, he's still the US ambassador to the Netherlands and nobody cares. Um, so all of us as individuals in this kind of post-truth age, and yes, we're all individuals, Monty Python reference, um, we, need to educate our, <laughs> we need to educate ourselves to how to deal and read with news that we see today, just as our forefathers had to do with previous media. So we have to learn to avoid clickbait headlines and actually read into the actual articles themselves and check what are the sources that they're making the story up from, um, look for differing viewpoints when we can, certainly before we share it out to our peers. And that's the more important the topic, the more important that is to do. If it's an opinion on like a sports star, it's not as important as to say a political opinion. But unfortunately, none of that's easy. In fact, actually there's been research that the more controversial an idea, fact checking actually can work against it. So that if, you, if a fact checker says you actually are wrong, that's fake, you hold your idea even closer than you did in the first place before it was fact checked. Also, the speed of communication evolutions today um, makes it even harder for each generation to understand the next. So it took 16 human generations to go from the printing press to the typewriter. But now in a single human generation, we've seen communications evolve quite rapidly. So what that means is that if you're a user of a newfangled communications uh, today, you can't go to your elders for societal advice and ethics on what you should do in that platform because they're not experienced with it. And likewise, the elders of a society who are making maybe the laws about this technology are trying to make laws for technology they don't fully understand because it's several generations ahead of what they can grasp. So to conclude, we live in a world today with more information than our brains are really designed to handle. And as a kind of self-defense mechanism, we've outsourced part of our opinion making and our memories to the crowd and to the cloud. But unfortunately, both of those can be manipulated. And this current phenomenon of kind of fake news and public opinion manipulation is not something new. It's just very old manipulation techniques and psychology being applied to modern communications media. But for those who want to misuse it, it's an incredibly powerful tool to control the minds of a population. Now, in time, all the various platform providers and social networks and so on will or may at least self-correct, but they do need time. So in the meantime, it's a responsibility for all of us who use the internet, or especially for us to educate the next generation who are going to use the internet, that they need to read in depth, they need to check the uh, differing opinion, and try to get outside of the bubble of content that has been pushed at them. Because if we don't take that extra time to go and read up on that before we share stories and make our own opinions, there are a lot of people out there who are more than happy to pay to manipulate your opinion for you. Thanks very much.